సహనావతు సహనౌ బునత్తు సహవీర్యం కరవాహై తేజస్వినాపదీతమస్తు మా విత్తిషావాయి ఓం శాంతి 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 మీ దట్ వన్ ప్రొటెక్ట్ అస్ బౌస్ మీ దట్ వన్ నరిష్ అస్ బౌస్ May we work together with great energy and vigor. May our studies be illumined. May we not unnecessarily cover with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Karuna shitala hridayam pradnya pradyuta vihita mohatamam sanaramara iloka kuram vande sugatam gati vimuktam ఓం బుధం శరణం గచ్చామి ధర్మం సంగం శరణం గచ్చామి హీ హూస్ హార్ట్ ఇస్ కూల్ విత్ కంపాషన్ హూస్ డాజ్లింగ్ ఇంటలెక్ట్ ఇస్ ఫ్రీ ఆఫ్ ఆల్ డొల్యూషన్ హీ హూ ఇస్ ద టీచర్ ఆఫ్ బోత్ హ్యూమన్ అండ్ సెలెస్టియల్స్ హిమ్ వీ సల్యూట్ హూ హెస్ రీచ్ ది అల్టిమేట్ గోల్ ఆఫ్ లైఫ్ అండ్ అస్ స్టాప్ ఫ్రమ్ దిస్ వెయిన్ వండరింగ్స్ of samsara this is an extract from the dhammapada which is a central text in the buddhist canon canon so uh, we are continuing to celebrate the birth life and teachings of the lord buddha and since we've had several talks on it uh I won't uh, repeat some of the things that were said already but this prayer tells us a little bit about the essence of what we call the enlightened one we can see that it characterizes the buddha as having a heart that is cool cool meaning that is balanced that has a certain equilibrium but overflows with compassion in addition to that a dazzling intellect and we can see that when the buddha approaches difficult problems and finds a solution by shifting the solution to a novel area an area that hasn't really been thought of before but gives access to a more profound dimension within us because the next words says he is free from or free of all delusion central teaching of any great great incarnation or any great teacher a light that has its effect for thousands and thousands of years will all be to do with freedom from delusion the language may change but this is what the central teaching is all about now you might question are we really deluded when we operate in our normal work when we get up in the morning brush the teeth have a breakfast go to work have a dialogue with fellow human beings deal with various difficulties and challenges that come up can we really say that we are deluded so that when we go to bed at night we feel absolutely exhausted and sometimes even dream of all our waking experiences we can see that the dream is some kind of delusion if you will if we assert that it is true or real but the factors that apply to dream will also apply to our waking state both are regulated by time time means that things are changing and things that are changing are not permanent both dreams and waking states are regulated by spatial awareness objects occupy dimensions and dimensions also are not fixed 
Dimensions are restricted. Dimensions are made from parts. They are aggregates. They are assembled from different component parts. And therefore, logic and experience will tell us that they will also disintegrate. So with no permanence for all of this, then uh, we can say, if we take it seriously and real, then it amounts to an, a level of delusion. And the real delusion is our lack of acknowledgement of it. Then he who is the teacher of both human and celestials. What do we mean by celestials? We have to put on a philosophical hat when we understand this. When we talk about celestials, we're talking about those subtle wave elements that sit behind our gross world of tables and chairs and bodies. When science investigates this at a very subtle level, they come across conundrum. They come across laws of nature and physics that clearly have no place in our world of sense experience. This subtle world, a wonderful, wonderful revolutionary discovery of the 20th century, has turned our physics on its head, leaving us with more questions than answers. The Holy Grail is to reconcile the determined universe with the indeterminism of the subtle. The celestials are those subtle forces that operate when they are mobilized by thought. And the whole of the universe is made from these undulating waves that manifest and crystallize in order to conform to our registration through the sense organs. So when we teach humans, we're teaching humans to register these celestials and in turn register these celestials to a cosmic mind. And when we say the Buddha, we are talking of a cosmic entity. Two things we're talking about. A historical manifestation that came as a giant wave to teach us. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, an expression of a cosmic mind that we could call the cosmic Buddha, enabling us to discover our own Buddhahood. To many Buddhists, Buddha is a state of being, a state of mind. It's not a necessarily a person, although, of course, there's a historical context to it, no doubt. So whenever these teachers standing in the position of cosmic mind declare anything from that level, they're talking in universal terms. They're talking in cosmic terms. They're talking for the whole of humanity. They're avoiding any form of sectarianism. They're transcending sects, organizations, religions, and egos, and all the competitiveness that occurs when we slot ourselves into any of these compartments. So we salute such a person who became the light, in the book, famous book, Light of Asia, who has reached the ultimate goal of life. In Buddhism, it is not that Buddha was born perfect. No, Buddha was an ordinary person, according to them, who attained this enlightenment, of course, Hindus will take this Buddha as an incarnation. It's irrelevant which one is true. Both are true in a sense. And has stopped from this vain wanderings of samsara. There's a famous song, Oh My Mind, or at least, yeah. Oh My Mind, this was sung by Naran first, when he sang first to Sri Ramakrishna, why do you linger? Why do you stay in a foreign land? Why don't you go home? And very often in spiritual life, it's to our advantage to address the mind in these ways, like a kindly uncle or a kindly aunt. Oh, my mind, what are you doing? Why are you wandering here and there? Why don't you settle? Why don't you go home? If you're climbing a mountain, 
then you see that there are dangerous robbers on either side, lust and greed and anger. But there are good rest houses. There are blessed ones who will help you on the way. There are teachers. There is scripture. There are many resources that act as a good solid rest house for us. And then please proceed. And if you're climbing a mountain, there's a direction. There's an aspiration. There's a completeness at the top. Leave it at the top. Concentrate on the journey. And this journey would be the spiritual path taught by Buddha, taught by any other teacher, who themselves directly realized the truth. And for that reason, were able to convey it to others. That light that they found emanated from them and converted anybody within their vicinity over a period of time. Over a period of time because many on the human level are not convinced. It depends how much resistance we have. That is why Jesus says, resist ye not evil. Replace the resistance by a let go attitude that allows a flow. Allow yourself to be covered, ca uh, uh, carried by divine grace. Some people find the most difficult discipline in life is letting go. There's an old Chinese example. If you're holding some small object in your right hand, and clutching onto it as if it is the last possession in the entire world, then you cannot accept a million euros. You cannot be in an accepting position if you're in a grasping position. You must be in an open position. And the openness occurs first from the heart, the open heart, the empathy, the understanding, the compassion. So we are <laughs> caught up in wandering in a kind of dream world, a world that has no permanence to it. Why should we do it? We mentioned the other day how one principal teacher that we have is pain. And there's no shortage of it. And so just to remind you, Buddha's strategy was simply a medical approach. Life is painful. You are suffering. There's a cause of it. When you deal with the cause, and go on a strategically aligned path, systematically changing your behavior, correcting it, making it pure. Pure means devoid of egoism or egocentric interests. Then the light reveals itself by itself from within, and you need not say or define what is the light. That was Buddha's technique. So that brings us again to a small background. And Buddha, like any other great teacher, decided to teach in parables and stories. We have no real record of all the stories. We do know that he taught in this way, and that he taught in the common language, and that he had a revolutionary attitude to religion of his day, eschewing the ritualistic portion, the dogmatic portion, any great Renaissance teacher will do the same. If we take any great, great leader, so-called founder of a religion, so-called because I don't think they ever intended to found something different. I've come to fulfill, not to destroy. So they simply took the condition of the day, found out all the obstacles in the way, what we call collectively Altharma, something that is stopping the harmonious flow of things and saying, okay, let us have a fresh look at it. Let us take all the obstacles that you're finding that uh, are in the way of a harmonious living and let us see if we can start afresh with new ideas, animal sacrifice. Well, why do you sacrifice animals? Oh, because we want to sacrifice the best. Why don't you sacrifice me, says the Buddha? If you value me so highly, I'd be the best. You can sacrifice me. So this is a kind of unusual thinking, going against the norm, the standards of the day, but a common sense attitude. When you see it, it's obvious, yes. So we get caught in a rut, that's the difficulty. And great teachers come 
and shake you out of the rut, not violently, but gently, persuasively, talking in the common language of the day, using convenient stories, similes, and so on. And many of them, actual stories, put this response to certain circumstances. One of the most famous circumstances was to do with Kisha Gotomi. She was a, a woman who, whose only son died at a very young age. And she carried the son. She was unwilling to accept his death, carrying him from neighbor to neighbor, thinking that somebody might have a remedy. One of the first stages in the bereavement process, we are told by the great expert, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who made a speciality of death and dying. Our first port of call is, we can't believe it. We're in a state of denial. It cannot happen to us. Famous story of Yudhishthira going to the lake, his brothers having gone before, a ghost having inhabited it, asking questions that have the capacity to release the brothers where they can take drinking water nicely. What is that paradox? Those greatest paradox that man is experiencing. Oh, it is that death, even though it's all around us, even though we've heard of it, even though we've seen it, but it'll never happen to us. The kind of skeleton that we keep in the closet and we don't even bring the subject up. In normal conversation, it's taboo. And those who have not experienced death and dying will be hard pressed to find adequate words to comfort somebody who is suffering from bereavement because they haven't experienced it. You can only really make your condolences or have a, a, a sense of empathy for somebody who is suffering. If you yourself haven't, uh, have not gone through the suffering, it's not possible. I remind you of something I said probably the other day, maybe the other week. I came across somebody who had a very good definition. He made a contrast between those who are religious and those who are spiritual. Religious people, he said, believe in hell, but spiritual people have gone through it. So, yes, this is something useful. We can go through all the downs in order to have the elation of the ups. Experience life in its fullness. Why not? It puts things in its perspective. And so, Gautama Siddhartha, who became the Buddha, experienced the contrast of an easy, luxurious lifestyle with the reality, the jarring reality of suffering, old age, disease, death, the bereavement that comes from it, and an effort to get out of it. These four things were seen. And so, this uh, Kisha Gotumi felt that she couldn't accept this, and it was possible to revive this young son. Now, many Buddhist parables and passages have echoes and parallels in the Christian Gospels, and this is brought about or highlighted by the writer Paul Karras in his Gospel of the Buddha. And we can see maybe there are flavors of Lazarus in the life of Jesus. She wants to beg from every neighbor for some medicine to bring her son back to life, thinking also the next stage, not only denial, but also anger, despair. How could this son die at such a young age with all his life ahead of him? And those who believe in God will steer their anger and channel their anger toward an unsuspecting God who is a, who's simply puts into life as a rhythm, both life and death. Everyone will have it. But how can we convince ourselves of this when it impacts on us personally? So one of her neighbors told her, oh, you should go and see the Buddha. Uh, because he's staying nearby, go and see him. Ask him if he has a way to bring her son back to life because not only is he a holy man, but he seems to be an enlightened man, fully enlightened man, having attained his nirvana or nibbana. 
And so she brought the body of her son and uh, presented this to Buddha and pleaded with him desperately to help bring her son back to life. So he gave her this instruction. He said he agreed. He said, okay, go back to your village and see if you can gather mustard seeds from all the households that you can find in your village. All the householders, only those that have not been touched by death. Somewhere in the family, somebody would have experienced a relative dying somewhere. If you can bring all those mustard seeds to me, I'll create a medicine from them, and I'll bring your son back to life. And so she went to the village, asked all the neighbors, please, can you supply mustard seeds? They said, yes. But unfortunately, our house has been touched by death. They were all willing to give, but they all told her that their households had been touched in this way. And they told her, the living are few, but the dead, these are many. And as the day became evening and then night, she was still without any of the mustard seeds and uh, that she had been instructed to collect. And she realized that there was a universality of death. Everybody experiences it. And according to the Buddhist verse, which is written down, translated here, her story comes from what she said, which was like this. It's just, it's not just a truth for one village or for one town, nor is it a truth for a single family, but for every world settled by gods and men, even celestials, even subtle beings living in all the subtle quarters of the universe, they will also have to go through it. It may take them eons in human time, but sure as anything, this death belongs to them as it belongs to men. This indeed is what is true. What is it true? Impermanence, a fundamental teaching of the Buddha. We don't have to go any further than that. What we call viveka or discernment or discrimination is just the fact of impermanence. Lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. This real is not the real in the sense of a denial of what the senses see or experience. It means this. If an elephant suddenly appears in your room and disappears, you rub your eyes and say, this was unreal. And the component of it is, it is impermanent. It comes, it's gone. You like asking a person in a car, you see, is my, are my indicated, indicated lights working? Yes, no, yes, no. It comes mm -hmm. off, off and on. Then supposing an elephant appears and suddenly changes to a mouse. You'll rub your eyes again. Such a sudden change. So change is evident of unreality in this sense, impermanence. And appearance and disappearance is also evidence of the same thing. <coughs> so this indeed is what is true. It is impermanence. With this new understanding, her grief, of course, was calmed because all our sufferings are caused by this realization of impermanence, whether it's death or anything else. But the fear of death is the mother of all fears. And she buried her son in the forest and then returned to the Buddha. And she confessed to Buddha that she could not obtain any of the mustard seeds he had instructed her to collect because she couldn't find even one house untouched by death. Now, this is uh, a wonderful lesson for us in this, because this question of birth and life of death is a central key issue, and we address birth very happily, but we shy away from death, couching it in more comfortable letter, uh, you know, words, words that obscure the harsh reality of it. I, when I first came to Ireland, I was told that there's a custom. When somebody dies, 
they prop him up in the pub and drink to his health. Seems a kind of a bit late for that, you know, a kind of uh, you know anomaly there, you know, and uh, and of course leads to confusion as alcohol does, you know. Two brothers, yeah, yes, two brothers in the, in a pub, you know, and after a few drinks, one says the other, "Was it you or your brother who drowned at sea?" And he says, "No, it must be my brother. I was never in the navy." So these things get obscured, and the same kind of confusion we find because filling up with the endorsement of a so-called reality obscures this phenomena of death. Because sooner or later, no matter how we become cheerful about it at that moment, it's a way really of hiding the fact. In Africa, the women there, or actually, well, women are engaged when somebody dies, and we couch it in language, pass away, you see, we gloss it over. And they are employed, really, to wail. In other words, to get all the emotion out, get it out, get it over with, until the harsh reality moves on and they accept it. Yes, grieve. Bhagavad Gita says, the wise grieve neither for the living nor death. I told this to a bereavement society once, that this was the position of our scripture. They were horrified because it's a grieving process. But then I had to say, but we are not wise. And acknowledging our lack of wisdom, why don't we express our emotion, get it out, and then apply our discernment, please, and understand, just as this widow has understood, there's a grieving, part of the grieving process is denial, and then followed by anger, followed by desperation, and ultimately acceptance, because we understand the reality of death. But the addition to this is, it's a comma, it's not a full stop. The life continues, the journey continues. That becomes a great, great comfort zone for those who suffered from bereavement. And Kisha entered the first stage of her enlightenment from her first, from this experience. And the story goes on that she decided to become a disciple of Buddhas, and went on to become the first female arahant, that is, dedicated, uh, dedicated monastic person. But as Kicha learned, when she couldn't connect or collect a single mustard seed, death is universal. Nearly everyone at some point in their life loses a loved one to death. This is a part of the impermanence of things that the Buddhists speak of and is a great, great rewarding experience. If you look at the great milestones in your life, certainly in my life, then the great radical change occurred around death. I remember a teacher of mine saying, understanding my own, say, bereavement at a young age, he said, Nature has a way, wherever there's a gap, of flowing through it and filling it with something useful and good. And this exactly happened in my own life. So I'm grateful for that. I've experienced many, many episodes of death in many different contexts. Now there are other parables and stories taken from the Buddha's life that we can also analyze. These are all useful. One common one will be the man who is born blind. It goes like this. There was a man born blind and he said, I do not believe in the world of light and appearance. Imagine if you're born blind, you don't know what is light, you don't know what is appearance. And we are told that those people who have always been blind, when they are given their sight back for some reason or other, say medically, then they have a completely different perspective. on. They have no sense, actually, of perspective and proportion. The whole world changes for them. Anyway, he said there are no colors. 
bright or somber because you speak in language about colors, about red and blue and this and that, and lovely green grass and so on. From my point of view, there are no colors. So because I take subjective experience to be the reality, I can't agree with you. I think you are deluded. There's no sun, no moon, no stars. No one has witnessed these things, he said. Because we all assume that our own condition is universal. In uh, a wonderful anti-statement to the atheistic position that can say, God doesn't exist because I don't see him. Even Richard Dawkins says, if there was a great, great cosmic finger that painted uh, itself across the sky, saying, I'm here and so on, I probably still wouldn't believe. So, Sri Ramakrishna would have said, well, you see, during the day you cannot see the stars. It doesn't mean to say they don't exist. So no one has witnessed these things, is my point of view. If I'm blind, his friends remonstrate with him, but he clung to his opinion, you can say obstinately. What you say that you see, he objected, are illusions. If colors existed, I should be able to touch them. They have no substance, are not real. Everything real has weight, but I feel no weight where you see colors. It must weigh something, isn't it? There was a, some kind of, I forget who it was. Anyway, they felt, I can prove the existence of a soul. You weigh a person before they die, weigh it afterwards, and the difference will be the weight of the soul. <laughs> Not taking into account so many factors. Anyway, there's no weight, therefore doesn't exist. I'm relying on all the senses that I have, that is sound and touch. Anything is, I can't hear colors, and I cannot weigh something. I can weigh a loaf of bread. I can weigh something you put in my hand, a sense of touch, there's nothing wrong. But I can't say that bread is brown, and I cannot say that grass is green, and I cannot say that sounds have colors or shapes or forms. But anyway, a physician was called to see the blind man. He mixed four components, four medicines, and... Uh, when he applied them to the cataract, which was the cause of the blindness, the gray film on his eyes lifted and melted and his eyes acquired the faculty of sight. The Tathagata says the story. The Buddha always referred to himself as Tathagata, open to many different interpretations. Wonderful statement because it has so many levels of meaning but you can say suchness, the person who is embodiment, just the fact of being and suchness, straight fact, is the physician. The cataract is the illusion of the thought I am. Now that's a very profound, uh, profound analogy. So what is blinding us? What is making us blind to the reality of things? The cataract that we have is this I, funnily enough. Funnily enough because, you know, you'd think that the I, I am, if you have I, you can see, but it's the I that is actually blinding us, that is making us not see. And all of us have this obstacle, I am. What we can call a profit-actor complex. I am doing this. I am doing that. I take ownership for it. I take ownership for that. I own my body. Very often you hear these days, I can do what I like, it's my body. The human rights taken to the nth degree, see. But when you inquire fully, do you really, personally, directly digest your food? Do you really put effort into planned pumping of the diaphragm, moving a piston up and down to enable breathing? Do you really personally repair the cells of the body? Did you really make an effort to be born into certain circumstances? Did you really have this full control? Are you really, really in charge of a deterministic world? No, you are not. You have no choice in it. If you feel that the 
possibilities are there and you're completely in charge and there are no restrictions, then a desire to fly will be fulfilled spontaneously, but it doesn't. Only man's intelligence supplied from elsewhere enables a person to invent an aircraft so that they can fly and transcend or bypass the long, lengthy process of biological evolution. So this I am is the key obstacle to our short-sightedness. And short-sighted is a good term because we're only looking as far as today, tomorrow, maybe next year, maybe five years. Now there's a great exercise that I touched on maybe a few days ago to ask somebody, no matter how old or how young they are, what do you think your life expectancy will be? And because death is a taboo, taboo subject, people get embarrassed and say, oh, I don't know. I have no idea. This is an impossible question. Well, you can have a fair idea. Statistically, the lifespan of a male in your country is what? Lifespan of a female is what? And then, are you overweight? What is your body mass index? Or are you living in Delhi? Because in Delhi, you're supposed to have 10 years or will come off your life because of the pollution. There can be a reasonable estimate, but why don't we do it? Why do we feel it's a useless exercise? Because we don't want to face this shadow of death. But realistically, if you knew, then you could pack so much more into it, isn't it? You could plan your life realistically, understanding a central goal and purpose in your life. And that central goal and purpose is the same for everybody. Just as everybody is born and lives and dies, everybody has a sense of purpose. Otherwise, the whole thing is meaningless. And the reductionist materialists will declare that. It's all just random. What the atheist calls with capital C by chance, religious people call capital G by God. But Buddha doesn't have God and doesn't have chance. But yet there's a deterministic policy. There is a purpose in life. What is it? Described in negative terms. Nibbana or Nirvana. The absence of all the causes of pain. If you extinguish all your desires completely, then what is left? It's not a nothingness which is left. And Vedanta will tell you it's a fullness. You describe it in those terms. This is full, that is full. From fullness comes fullness. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. There's a peace prayer that is repeated. So these are the four aspects of it. The four medicines or the four combinations that make the medicines in this analogy are the four noble truths. Swami Shanti Vratananda last night gave a beautiful talk on these four noble truths. And so I won't expand on that. But we begin off from a starting point. There are, we are suffering under a malady. We are suffering from pain, painful situation, physically, emotionally, psychologically, we're unbalanced. Because we take this delusion and we react to it in such a way that we are registering, and we're putting a permanent stamp on it and not looking any further. And the real stamp is this egocentric position that assumes an individuality. So how do we get rid of it? We won't go into that because the Four Noble Truths will tell us, the last one will tell us the way. But simply to repeat that Buddha was such a great teacher, he only required two hands. On the one hand, he declared Four Noble Truths. On the other hand, he declared Eightfold Path. You don't have to go any further than that. Metaphysics, leave it alone. But you see, many of his followers were Brahmins and wanted philosophy and metaphysics. And certainly in his own lifetime, the lament was, alas, the order, the Sangha is divided. There's another story. It's called The Lost Son. And here we can see some kind of parallel with the Christian, the prodigal son. It goes like this. There was a householder son who went away into a distant country. And while the father accumulated measurable riches, the son became miserably poor. And the son, while searching for food and clothing, happened to come to the country in which his father lived. 
The father saw him in his wretchedness, for he was ragged and brutalized by poverty, and ordered some of his servants to call him. And when the son saw the place to which he was conducted, he thought, I must have evoked the suspicion of a powerful man, and he will throw me into prison. He didn't recognize his own father. And full of apprehension, he made his escape before he had seen his father. And a very great twist on the prodigal son. Then the father sent messengers out after his son, who was caught and brought back in spite of his cries and lamentations. <laughs> Thereupon the father ordered his servants to deal tenderly with his son, understanding his confusion. And he appointed a laborer of his son's rank and education to employ the lad as a helpmate on the estate. And the son was pleased with his new situation. And from the window of his palace, the father watched the boy. And when he saw that he was honest and industrious, he promoted him higher and higher. In other words, removing suspicion more and more and more. After some time, the summoned, he summoned his son and called together all his servants and made the secret known to them, this is my son. Then the poor man was exceedingly glad and was full of joy at meeting his father. Just so, little by little, must the minds of men be trained for the higher truths. Because we're quite happy, seemingly, or we declare it, where we are now. We don't want to acknowledge that better things are there. A whole realm of infinite possibilities are within us and around us. And instead of exploring and exploiting these to their fullness, we are content with a few scraps here and there and happy in our poverty. So this is a wonderful, wonderful parallel to the story of Kingdom of Heaven and the story of the prodigal son with a, a deeper kind of more profound implication that really we are denying our own so-called inheritance our own infinite possibilities. And as long as we're preoccupied with our own poverty, we are denying the possibility of infinite riches, not material riches, but infinite rewards of joy and bliss that are within us. If you say that the goal is the extinction of all desires, you would think that's distinction in the extinction of all joys because that's how we rate it. That's how we value it. That's our bargaining position. That's how we go into the shops. We buy according to what we know. It's like the story of a person who takes a diamond and wants you know, to a brinjal seller and says, you know, what is it worth? And he looks at it and says, probably one brinjal, you know, not seeing the value or worth of what it is. He has to take it to a jeweler, where the jeweler will see the true value of it. Then, of course, there's the story of the father who went away. And during his absence, brigands came and uh, burnt the whole village down. And when the father came back, saw all the ashes of all the victims of these people who had Unfortunately, he died in the fires and he saw a small remnants of ashes and assumed it was his son. Of course, his son had actually managed to escape. And then he took the ashes and carefully grieved over them, scattered them, and uh, first of all, putting them, preserving them in a pot. And the son came back home knocked on the door and the father thought oh the brigands have come back they've i'm your son he says no it cannot be i have the ashes of my son in my own hands go away <laughs> so we can derive many many profound lessons from this the denial of what is the reality on the one side and on the other side the desperate urge to be reconciled with the father and the misunderstanding between the two. The wonderful story. 
We have probably time for one more story. The story is the peacemaker. It's reported that two kingdoms were on the verge of war for the possession of a certain embankment which was disputed by them. We can in modern times relate it to countries, stretches of land where one declares is mine, another one declares not mine. In the ancient days, the same kind of disputes occurred over land. And the Buddha, seeing the kings and their armies ready to fight over land, over a piece of land, requested them to tell him the cause of their quarrels. And having heard the complaints on both sides, he said, Okay, I understand that the embankment has value for some of your people. Um, has it any intrinsic value aside from its service to your men? No, it has no intrinsic value whatsoever, was the reply. Then the Tathagata continued, Now when you go to battle, is it not sure that many of your men will be slain and that you yourselves, O kings, are liable to lose your own lives? You're risking your own lives also for these embankments. And they said, yes, it's sure that many will be slain and our own lives may be jeopardized. Well, the blood of men, however, said Buddha, has it less intrinsic value than a mound of earth? No, the king said. The lives of men, and above all, the lives of kings, are priceless. Then the Tathagata concluded, Care you going to stake? Are you going to stake that which is priceless against that which has no intrinsic value or whatever? The wrath of the two monarchs abated, and they came to a peaceful agreement. And here we see the wisdom of the Buddha as a peacemaker also, and how relevant it is to our own times. And it comes back to this intrinsic obstacle for our sightedness. But on a national level now, or even can be an international level, where we fight over a piece of land, and the question is, is it worth the countless lives and sufferings? Is the land more valuable than all the refugees and all the people who got blown up? and all the people who lost their lives, soldiers and civilians, in this day and age, soldiers and civilians. This is the tragedy of this modern time. There was Bharadwaja, a wealthy Brahmin farmer. He was celebrating his harvest thanksgiving when the Buddha, known as the Blessed One, came with his arms bowl begging for food. And some of the people paid him reverence, but the Brahmin was angry and said, it would be more fitting for you to go to work than to beg. In other words, he's implying, you're a lazy fellow. You're getting all your food for nothing. The kind of story like that, you know. There were uh, two, uh, two squirrels, you know, and one was storing away the nuts for the winter and diligently doing it knowing that the winter would be harsh. And the other squirrel was just eating all the nuts he could find, not storing anything. And then winter came, and there was a knock on the one squirrel's door who had stored all the nuts. and said, I'm really starving in a bad way. Can I come in? And the squirrel that had stored the nuts, out of compassion, said, of course, yes, come in and share some. Now, if you're not careful, you'll take the moral of the story as you can be lazy because somebody else will give you a handout. <laughs> but a better moral would be if you are careful and diligent with what you have, then you also have the capacity to share it with others, even though they may be foolish. And it would have been better for both of them to have stored up for the winter because even the suffering that the one squirrel had could have been avoided. Anyway, you should not beg for your food, you should work. That's the message. A plow, I plow and sow, and having plowed and sown, I eat, says the farmer. And if you did likewise, then you wouldn't have some, you would also have something to eat and you wouldn't have to beg. 
But the Tathagata answered him and said, O oh, Brahman, I too plow and sow, and having plowed and sowed, I eat. What do you profess to be a husbandman, uh, an agriculturalist? Where then are your bullocks to plow the fields? Where's your plow? Where's the seed? Where are all these things? Where's your field? The Blessed One said, Faith is the seed I sow. That's a remarkable statement. What is faith in this context? It's a resolve, it's a thought that you put in that has some great value and that has a let go attitude that is enough trust to know it will grow into something good. So faith is the seed and good works are the rain that fertilizes it. Because once you sow the seed with faith, then you can be assured all the conditions will be provided. The earth will provide the nutrients, the rain will provide the moisture, the seasons will allow the seed to grow in its own due time. Wisdom and modesty are the plow. My mind is the guiding rain. I lay hold of the handle of the law. Earnestness is the goad I use. That is the encouraging thing that you normally use on the bullocks. And exertion is my pulling ox. This plowing is plowed to destroy the weeds of illusion. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're not taking out all the weeds of illusion, then it's of no value. The harvest it yields is the immortal fruits of nirvana, and thus all sorrow ends. Then the Brahmin poured rice milk into a golden bowl and offered it to the Blessed One, saying, Let the teacher of mankind partake of the rice milk, for the venerable Gotama plows, a plowing that bears the fruit of immortality. That doesn't mean to say don't work. It means work with a shifted attitude, an attitude that has no stress within it, that is aimed at the goal of immortality overcoming death and that's where we started our story about the widow whose son had died thinking that death was the conqueror not knowing that actually the goal is to conquer immortality or conquer mortality that actually at the end of the day the fundamental reality is immortal unchanging undivided and infinite Thank you. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thank you, Swamiji. Um, thank, thank you. Mercy, Swamiji. See you tomorrow, Swamiji. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Swami. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Swamiji. Okay. Thank you. Oh.